Cool. Um, so we are just going to go through and look at these reactions for starters. Um, the main thing we're looking at is remember that with all these alkene reactions that we have to this point, it's basically we're breaking the pi bond, adding something to each side. So it's just a matter of, of reading the clues in the reaction to remember what am I adding in what in what order. If you can remember that, that kind of takes care of the Markovnikov. Because the second thing you add is pretty much always going to go on the more substituted carbon, right? That takes care of is it Markovnikov, anti Markovnikov, if you can just remember the order that you're adding things. And for something like, oops. For something like uh, H2, for hydrogenation, or for halogenation, it doesn't really matter what the order is, right? Because we're we're looking for if it's the same thing on each side, then at most we need to remember is it sin or is it anti-addition in order to know whether our substituents are going to be on the same side of a ring or if they're going to be trans at the end. All right, so while Markovnikov still gets his name in the history books and we still learn his name, it's really it's more of a, a law in the sense that it doesn't explain why things happen, just what happens. And knowing the mechanism is much more useful in terms of, at least in general terms, knowing the mechanism. It doesn't, you don't have to be able to draw the whole thing necessarily to be able to remember what's Markovnikov and anti Markovnikov. So we had sin addition for the hydroboration, we're going to add its hydration. As is this one. These are both hydration, one's Markovnikov, one's anti-Markovnikov, and they they add to opposite sides as well. So we would wind up with for the Markovnikov anti-addition. We add the hydrogen to one side, the OH to the other side. Does Markovnikov really matter for this reaction, though? They're both secondary, right? Both both the alkene carbons are secondary. So we get a mixture of products. Where we'd have, we wind up with four different products. Where we wind up with our new hydrogen, I guess now we would not wind up with four, yeah, we would, four different products. It doesn't matter whether the hydrogen gets added up or down because, because we wind up adding two hydrogens to, or having two hydrogens that are identical on the same carbon. So we only are adding one new stereo center, but we're doing it on two different carbons. And so our possibilities are, let me, let me just go to a full whiteboard here so we can. We wind up making this molecule. And this molecule probably more, so this is the oxymercuration. The mercury is probably gonna go predominantly on the opposite side from the methyl, just based on sterics, which would mean that this one is more favored because that member that the, the uh, OH is gonna come in and add opposite of where the mercury was. So if the, and the mercury is bigger than the OH. So if the mercury is going to stay opposite of the methyl group, that means that the OH is going to be on the same side of the methyl group in, a, in the most stable version. And plus, if we actually looked at this and looked at chair versus um, or axial versus equatorial, these two both being both being cis and on adjacent carbons means that they can both be equatorial at the same time. Let's see. Hey, Brad, 
So if we had the methyl up, we'd wind up with the OH out. So I guess that's axial and equatorial. We wind up with them being one axial, one equatorial. If they were, so it, this is probably one where kinetic versus thermodynamic control would make a difference because this one is gonna be the more stable thermodynamically as far as sterics go. But the one where they're cis is going to be favored kinetically by rates because of the mercury being able to stay away from the methyl group more. And it gets, so it gets a little bit tricky. We're gonna, the, the main point though, is we do wind up with a mixture of both of them in this case. Let's see, and then the other possible isomers, we have the same two possibilities just with our new OH group being on carbon three versus, uh, relative to the methyl versus carbon two relative to the methyl. And this one, the one where they're, so this is probably actually going to be our most, our most stable project, probably our major product is gonna be the one I circled in red. Cause that's the one both where the mercury is able to stay away from the methyl group in the intermediate. And you make a product where, where the two groups, the two substituents on the cyclohexane are both able to be equatorial at the same time. So it's favored both kinetically and thermodynamically relative to its ice or it's um, an antumor or I guess that's a diastereum or not an antumor. That's so that was for this reaction over here. For the halohydrin formation, that's going to go through that triangular intermediate again. And you're and then you have water coming in and acting as a nucleophile to break that up. So actually, it's actually a very similar mechanism to the oxymercuration. You just start by making that triangular intermediate with bromine instead of with mercury, um, and then bringing water in as a nucleophile. So it's gonna be this, almost the same for, we're gonna have more, go back to the, the uh, bigger whiteboard here. So here's our starting material. The main thing is that the bromine and the and the oxygen have to be on opposite sides of the ring. They have to be trans relative to each other. So we still, despite the fact we're adding two new stereo centers, we're only, which gives us, gives us a total of three stereo centers. We're only gonna wind up with four stereo isomers because no matter what, we can't have the oxygen and the bromine on the same side of the ring structure. That, so that cuts out um, half of our possible stereo isomers really. So we can have we could have oxygen up, which would mean bromine down, or we could flip those. Then we have the same two stereo isomers, but with the OH and the bromine switched. If we switch their two positions. So we could have bromine, OH, So 
what I would recommend when it comes to drawing these, make sure you one, don't duplicate stereoisomers too much and get all the possibilities is to really treat it almost mathematically. What are my, you, know, you have to be systematic about how you draw them. So the way that I organized them here was for the blue ones, I kept the oxygens and the bromines on the same carbons and flipped, flipped whether they were up or down. And then I switched and is put switch the oxygen and the bromines carbons and drew them both up and down. If you try to just go in a straight line without being somewhat systematic about how you're thinking about these variables, it's really easy to redraw the same stereoisomer or to draw stereoisomers that you couldn't get. Um, so it, I, I tend to try and think about these in terms of like, I, I use this example a lot, but a Punnett square. You have two options on one side of the table and two options on the other side of the table. How do you fill it in? Bromine can be up and down and it can be on carbon two or carbon three. Right, so when you fill in your options that way, that I find that to be a helpful way to organize my thoughts for these. Um, and so while I can't understand necessarily how everybody else's brains work, all I can do is explain how my brain organizes this and hope that your brain can work the same way to some extent or you find a way to work that works for you. If you do come up with other ways of thinking about these, I appreciate hearing about them so that I can broaden my horizons. All right, the nice thing about hydrogen hydrogenation in this case, no stereoisomers. Same thing being added to both sides of the alkene, and it's and we're adding them to a bond that it's already has one hydrogen right there. So we're gonna get no stereoses, we're just gonna get methyl cyclohexane. HCl, we're going to get something very similar to what we did first, um, but we're going to go through a carbocation intermediate, and we're only adding one new stereo center. It could be on carbon, and it does also have, because we're going through, we're going through a carbocation intermediate, adding HCl means you get rearrangement which once again means we're going to get one favored reaction. We're going to get one product that's favored over everything else. And it doesn't even have an enantiomer. We're just going to get one chloromethyl cyclohexane. And now both directions around the ring are identical, so we don't even have R plus S. And then in this case, being that we don't have anything where Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov really matters, they're both secondary, our products for that reaction are the same as for the oxymercuration. We're still gonna get four products. We could have oxygen up or down on carbon two, we could have oxygen up or down on carbon three. And difficult to say exactly which one would be favored. We'd have to go through the mechanism and look at sterics um, like we did for the oxymercuration to be able to take a guess, but we're gonna get a, it's, none of them are gonna be favored so strongly by sterics in this case that we would say we only get one product. So just like with the, oxy, with the oxymercuration, we get all four of those products in some sort of um, sterics influenced mixture. All right, so just a brief recap. Those are all the reactions we've done so far. We have two more to add for this chapter for alkenes. Um, and they're not, one of them is an addition reaction and the mechanism is actually really simple compared to some of these we've done. The other one is not an addition mechanism at all. 
Um, it's what's known as an oxidative cleavage, which basically means we're gonna chop, we chop right through the alkene group and we add oxygens in its place. Um, so that's gonna be our first reaction we really have to this point where we can actually change the carbon structure of a molecule is oxidative cleavage. And it's actually the way that they, one of the main ways we have of purifying water um, is basically just expose it to ozone um, because ozone, when which is O3, um, reacts really, really strongly with with carbon carbon pi bonds and basically chops them up. And since almost all bacteria and viruses and amino acids have um, carbon carbon pi bonds somewhere, we wind up being able to just basically chop them up into small pieces where there's still organic matter in there, but now all of a sudden it's not dangerous to humans nearly as much, or you, and you can then filter it out easier because it's not living bacteria um, so much. So we'll talk about that one in a minute. We'll start with um, epoxides. This quick note while I'm thinking about it. If I put the Zoom link that I use to record this on the, on the website, um, would that be helpful? Would anybody actually be up? watching in real time or if you weren't able to be here would you you're just going to watch the recording probably anyway that's that's my personality too is if i'm not going to be here in person i might as well just watch the recording and not get up at eight o'clock um so that's why i have not made that publicly available but anybody watching the recording if you feel differently and you would like to be up at eight o'clock watching real time, let me know. And I'll put the link on uh, on the canvas shell. Yeah. So something I've been kind of curious about when we were talking about the oxygen activation, mm -hmm. the, uh, decarbonation, uh, how big roughly would the mercury have to be compared to the cycle? Let's see if there's any good models of um, of these figures. I mean, Mercury is big. It's got D orbital, not just a D orbital. It also has an F orbital, if I'm remembering it properly. Um, Yeah, I don't have any space filling ones off the top. It's pretty big. Um, I want to say we'll just do mercury ion radius. The one, I guess it's not that big. Um, it's, uh, it's, where'd it go? 1.76 angstroms. And a carbon atom has a has a radius of about actually carbon atom has a diameter of about one angstrom, so more than twice as big. Um, let's see, I have a better handle on. Yeah, that's what I was going to look at. one point assuming this interaction with mercury with different sites on graphene so 2.2 to 2.3 angstroms versus and a normal carbon carbon and alkene bond length is about 1.3 angstroms so the bond length is a, not quite twice as big as well um, actually Let's, so if we just look at, push that button. So our, yeah, our bond length here is about 
and don't have my right. There we go. And I'm stressing this computer out. There it goes, 1.34 angstroms there. So the bond to mercury from carbon is about 2.4. It's pretty high up here. It's a pretty big complex that we wind up making. But good question, because we were talking about the sterics of the mercury affecting things earlier too. Um, when, we, when we actually do, there's a better tool than Moldview for actually visualizing these in 3D, um, but we have to actually install a program for it to work consistently. And I can't do that here. Um, so when we get to computational chemistry, we'll be able to model things like that and see, and it has all these bond lengths sort of stored. So even without doing calculations, you can get an idea of what something might look like. Um, all right, so, but for the most part, everything that's on the second row of the periodic table is really close to the same size. Lone pairs are bigger, but the, all the bond lengths, the carbon hydrogen bond length, is right around one angstrom. An angstrom is a tenth of a nanometer, it, but it's more convenient for describing molecules because bond lengths are about one angstrom. Um, so physicists like to do bond lengths in either picometers or nanometers, and then you're either dealing in the hundreds or in tenths of a, of a nanometer. Um, but we use angstroms a lot in chemistry. All right. so. These epoxides are actually really handy and they actually show up a lot industrially. Um, that's actually where the term epoxy comes from. Epoxies are similar reactions here where you wind up making an epoxide or you mix an epoxide with something else that allows it to react and then you wind up turning it into one giant polymer by, by mixing these two tubes together. Um, and so we make them by reacting uh, alkenes with peroxy acids. So remember that peroxy, peroxides are oxygens that have a single bond. We have two single bonds, but, or sorry, two oxygens with a single bond between them. All right, so hydrogen peroxide looks like this, right? And that middle bond is the peroxide bond. So a peroxy acid looks a lot like a regular carboxylic acid, except it's got a peroxide linkage in between. Right? And the, those peroxy bonds, those peroxide bonds tend to be really unstable for a few reasons. Um, most notably when you don't have a double bond between, so oxygen gas is already reactive. When you take away the pi bond between the two oxygens, it's even easier to break them apart. Um, it, all it takes is a little bit of heat, really, um, a little bit of uh, infrared radiation, and you're able to, to break apart those two oxygens. And with that bond being really symmetrical, you break it apart typically in a way that is um, that is symmetric as well. So you wind up, if you shine light on hydrogen peroxide, you wind up making two OH radicals. Because when you shine light or add heat, you split that bond homolytically. You split it symmetrically which means each of the oxygens takes one of the one of the um, electrons in that bond, and so you make something that's really unstable. Yeah. Bingo. Anything that you see in those opaque brown containers or black containers, it's because it's light sensitive. Um, so iodine is the other really common one that you just see at the grocery store. Iodine does the same thing even though it's not mostly present as I2, if you have I2 and you shine light on it, the light hits at the right wavelength where you allow, you can move an electron from a bonding orbital to an antibonding orbital and you split up and make radicals. 
which then if you have other things around, if the two radicals happen to just bump back into each other, you remake what you started with. But since these are almost always dissolved in water, what happens instead is they grab an electron from water and you wind up with a bunch of reactions happening and, and um, either oxidizing the oxygen in water or reducing the hydrogen in water and making oxygen gas or hydrogen gas or some combination of both, depending on the concentrations. Um, so, and this is, this is why peroxides are so dangerous and why oxygen is in itself, when we breathe oxygen, it is a carcinogen. Because when our body takes O2 and, and tries and adds O2 to carbon to fully oxidize the carbon in glucose, um, one of the steps, several of the steps rely on a, a peroxide ion being bound to an enzyme for a few minutes. Well, microseconds, but um, long enough that occasionally our enzymes during the electron transport chain will let go of a peroxide um, and it just floats away into the cell, which can then cause a lot of damage if it's not. That's why our body has what's called free radical scavenging pathways. And that's actually what an antioxidant is, is basically the vitamin that supports that pathway. So antioxidants are actually a good thing. It's not just marketing. You probably don't need as many as, as you know, supplement stores tell you you do. Um, and free radicals are in fact bad for you, um, but you make free radicals in your body just by virtue of breathing. Um, so it's not like something where you can totally avoid all free radicals and therefore never get cancer. You live long enough, you will get cancer. Um, that's just how the human body works. Anyway, beside the point, it's not talking about peroxy acids in, um, or peroxides in general. Let's get a little more specific. With the peroxy acids, like I said, it looks a lot like a regular carboxylic acid, except with an extra oxygen in it. So when we are, when we're drawing these, a lot of times it'll just get written as RCO3H because CO, RCO2H, that's just a regular acid. CO through it, three H that's a peroxy acid. And we're actually not making use of the peroxide bond in this case, this one being really um, a reaction that happens really consistently. I it is partly because you can break an oxygen off pretty easily, but also because we get this sort of five sided ring structure kind of forming that allows us to move a lot of electrons around pretty easily and switch where stuff is without actually fully breaking something off of the molecule at any one point. We now never wind up with anything that has a, an incomplete valence at any point here. And you can't do that with a regular acid because a regular acid, you don't have this hydrogen close enough to the other oxygen to be able to switch things over this easily. So it's actually the shape of this whole thing, of that, that structure right there that allows us to do this. It's that proton transfer that happens within the same molecule that allows this to work. Right? And so it's four arrows all at the same time. And, but the main piece here is that you wind up you wind up making sort of a three sided ring structure once again just with oxygen now and that there's a proton transfer step and moving some electrons over on the right side of that line just to keep it you go from a peroxy acid to a regular acid and basically that gives us the ability to kick off that extra oxygen and it winds up bonding to make the epoxide And so these are, epoxides are not all that stable, right? So we're making a three-sided ring. There's a lot of strain energy there because these are all supposed to be tetrahedral electron geometries, right? But we're forcing it to be a ring, which 
is going to have a you know bond angles close to 60 degrees. Um, so it's not super stable, but we did go from a pi bond to all sigma bonds and all sigma bonds is a little bit more stable in theory as well. So it's not that uphill in energy. If you start from an alkene or something with pi bonds, it's not that uphill in energy to make an epoxide despite all the strain energy. Um, and then, like I said, the other thing we wind up making is our other product is just the regular carboxylic acid version. So a lot of times these peroxyacetic acid or per, um, I don't think they usually use peroxybenzoic acid, but it's just a, usually it's a pretty common carboxylic acid with that prefix peroxy in front of it. It tells you that you're dealing with this CO3H group. So this is a weird looking mechanism, but it's not all that tricky. It's not, it's one step basically. It's a concerted mechanism. Um, you just have to know that this proton transfer step is happening and what your net result is. And you can usually kind of figure out what's going on. Okay, a pair of electrons is going to the oxygen. A pair of the oxygen's electrons are going to the other carbon to sort of insert the oxygen in between the two carbons. They are. They're slightly polar and it depends on what you have the epoxide attached to. But, and, but the strain energy means it's also really easy to then cause this to go through another sort of addition reaction with pretty much anything else, anything, any other nucleophile can come in here and attack one of those carbons and break that three-sided ring open, just like we saw with the bromine and the mercury three-sided rings, right? The next step for those was always, and then a nucleophile comes in and breaks that up. Peroxides not being charged means that they're stable enough, we can package them like this. And that's actually, so that's what's in one of those tubes of epoxy is gonna be an epoxide. And then the other side um, where, that you're mixing it together is gonna to be something that has a nucleophile, usually probably um, an alcohol molecule, a long alcohol molecule, because the oxygen in that alcohol can come in and attach to one of these carbons. And you can wind up with this big polymerization reaction happening where you, you basically, one of the reasons why epoxies are so strong and why they last so long is basically you're turning all of that glue you're mixing together into one giant molecule by letting it cure and dry. It's not just letting it dry and set in place where then if you added solvent, you could redissolve it. Epoxies are totally resistant to all pretty much all organic solvents in water because once you get a giant molecule, it doesn't dissolve in anything. It doesn't matter whether it's acetone or water. That's, that's not what I want. I just want you to go away. So then the second step for these, like I said, is, is called an, um, a ring opening reaction. So we've encountered these before, like I said, but as part of a larger mechanism, but they're actually, it's a whole class of mechanisms that go through this ring, these ring openings. Um, and it's, it can go through an acid catalyst, it can go through actually through a, a base catalyzed reaction as well. Um, because all that would really happen is you switch the order of some of these proton transfers. Um, if you go through an acid catalyzed ring opening, then first thing you do is you protonate the epoxide which all of a sudden makes this is, would be a lot stable, more stable if it only had two bonds on that oxygen, right? So it makes it, the, it really easy for a nucleophile to come in and attach to one of those two carbons and, then, and the oxygen takes its uh, electrons and you wind up making a diol. So a diol is just like a diene was a molecule that had two alkene group groups, 
a diol is a is a um, molecule that has two alcohols. If we did this under very basic conditions, what would it look like? We wouldn't start with the proton transfer, right? Because there's no extra protons around. But if we're in very basic conditions, what do we have around? Nucleophiles. Yeah, bases also tend to be good nucleophiles, right? So we still have our our uh, molecule here. If instead of having a proton transfer to make it a better leaving group, we just have our nucleophile attack. So if it's base catalyzed, we wind up with same general reaction. We still are going to get a trans diol. It's just that we would need something to come back and protonate at the end. We don't need to start with the proton transfer. We would end with the proton transfer, depending on the conditions. Now, if we had now, if we had water floating around as well, we could have our second step look something like that to get our same final product. And same general mechanism, there's a lot of mechanisms in organic chemistry um, that if it can be catalyzed by an acid, it can also be catalyzed by basic conditions. You just have to change the order of some of the steps in the mechanism. Um, that's the one, there's, uh, there's one that's a particular interest in brewing. Um, I'm trying to think of what's the name of that reaction it's when you the reaction where you split um, a sucrose molecule into a glucose and a fructose um, it's not quite glycolysis because that's breaking up a glucose but it's splitting up sucrose there's a specific name for it and it's close to glycolysis and it's, it might just be a hydrolysis of sucrose um, but you can catalyze that like in so Yeast does not digest sucrose very well, but it digests glucose and fructose both really well. So if you are trying to, to grow a yeast starter um, for brewing or for, for bread making, actually, you start by having some sugar. And then if you just add a squeeze of lemon juice to it and heat it, you split, up, split it up into glucose and fructose. But you can do it with basic conditions as well just by, it just switches the order of some of the mechanism steps. It's still a hydrolysis and it still gives you the same products um, just in a different order. So this gives us an anti-dihydroxylation. So a hydroxyl group is another word or is the prefix version of an alcohol. Um, so we're going to start getting into some functional groups that can be named with either a prefix or a suffix, or sometimes like we would want to refer to like specifically to one of the groups. Um, and so a hydroxyl is an OH group. Um, so dihydroxylation means that we're adding two OHs. We're ending with a, di with a diol. And if we go through this pathway with the, with the peroxy acid, we get an epoxide. And then if we just give that a little bit of acid, um, then we wind up with a trans diol, where you wind up with the same thing added to both. The, the net result is still an addition reaction relative to where we started, right? 
except we're adding an OH to each side as opposed to a hydrogen to one side and an OH for the other. So it's not a hydration because we're adding two oxygens. Um, and then for this particular mechanism, we wind up adding them um, trans relative to each other. It's an anti-addition. Which means there's probably a way we can do it the other way. Um, so there is a way we can do sin dihydroxylation. Sin dihydroxylation uses osmium tetraoxide, which is pretty nasty. Um, osmium itself is pretty toxic in general, and it's got, in this case, it's got an oxidation state of plus eight. So it's a very reactive molecule for several reasons, um, very toxic for several reasons. Um, but in this case, it winds up being very useful because it gives us, instead of making a trans diol, it gives us a way to make an, a cis diol. So same net result, except we wind up adding the two, two OHs to the same side. And that's based on just the sterics. So the first one added the two oxygens in two steps. So you had, you made your epoxide and then had the ring opening, had the nucleophile attack. With the osmium tetraoxide, you start by making this cyclic structure. You're, so essentially you're adding both oxygens at the same time. And if you're adding both oxygens at the same time from the same molecule, just spatially that have to be added to the same side of the ring, right? You can't have it adding above and below when all of your oxygens are coming from the same side. Um, so you make this osmium, let's see, referred to as a cyclic osmate ester. Um, not very many people actually would use that, they would just call it the osmium intermediate for the most part. But then all we really have to do is we just remove the osmium and you can notice that there's no mechanism arrows for that second step, right? Which just like with the mercury where I said, well, organic chemists just kind of hand wave a lot of the metal ion mechanisms because metals are weird. Um, and, and actually, frankly, a lot of times these mechanisms, the, the metal reductions that remove metals um, are not fully understood. They're, we know that there, there might be three or four different possible pathways, or it could be something we don't know about at all yet. But we know that we all we know when it comes to a lot of these organometallic reactions where you're removing the metal is that magic happens. And then there's no metal left and we get a product that we like. Um, so that is still an area of active research just because it bothers some people to not be able to say why it happens. Um, and that's a good thing. We love those people because they drive science forward. For the most part, for the average synthetic chemist or for somebody going into a different field, they really mostly care about the end result. Synthetic chemists generally only care about mechanisms to the extent that it affects the, what product they get. If they get a very specific product but don't know the mechanism, they don't really care generally, um, unless there's something they can tweak about it to change what their product is. Because synthetic chemists, their whole deal is, I wanna make one specific product with as great a yield as possible. And how I get there is interesting to me, but the mechanisms less so generally. All right, so we added one more class of reactions, these dihydroxylation reactions. We started the epoxides will continue to show up because epoxides in general wind up being a useful intermediate because you can then turn around and do a ring opening reaction with a lot of different nucleophiles um, in order to make a lot of different products down the road and a lot of different um, functional groups. 
So epoxides will continue to show up. The osmium tetroxide basically only shows up in this textbook for this specific reaction. So remembering what a cyclic osmate, osmate ester is is less important than remembering what an epoxide is. That is a peroxy acid. Because remember, peroxy means, so think if you remember back to your, um, remembering your uh, polyatomic ions, Per always added an extra oxygen to something but kept the charge the same, right? Per chlorate versus chlorate. Per oxide versus oxide, you added an extra oxygen, but you keep the same charge. So if oxide is oxygen with a two minus, per oxide is O2 with a two minus. And so a peroxy acid just means you've got one of those, those an extra oxygen, but kept everything else the same. All right, that's just probably a good spot to to call it here. We'll have one more reaction that we'll that we'll talk about afterwards. We might finish a little bit early, but there's a bunch of practice at the end that we can go through, um, uh, or we might just end early, and I might use those for. Uh, depending on how things are looking um, and use those for the uh, quiz later. So we'll see. Let's come back at, at uh, nine o'clock.
Yeah, I, yeah, it's and that's pretty useful because iodine makes a really good leaving group for synthetic chem, chemistry, and a lot of a lot of times you get significantly better yields if you can start from the iodide versus the bromide. The bromide will give you the results, but maybe with seventy percent yield, where it's the iodide would might give you in the nineties. I thought this was funny. Somebody raging about NMR not being real. On the other hand, we are going to continue. <laughs> we are going to continue to learn more about NMR, like carbon NMR and then 2D NMR, which is what this one is. So when you put two NMRs on top of each other. <laughs> All right. So let's go back and we will continue to add our last reaction for chapter eight. Um, one of the most general way of referring to this is oxidative cleavage, which again, cleavage in the sense that we're just breaking things in half, we're cutting something up oxidative in the sense that we're adding oxygens to our carbon material. Um, the more almost always oxidative cleavage is referring to ozonolysis. Ozonolysis is technically, it's the more specific version of, there are other versions of oxidative cleavage you can use. Um, but in, in most cases, we're talking about ozonolysis for this class anyway. Um, and the reaction is really, it looks fairly straightforward. Um, it's just, you just add ozone, O3, to an alkene. And then you add DMS, which is dimethyl sulfide. Um, and the dimethyl sulfide we'll talk about in a minute. But the, the effect is, instead of being an addition reaction where you break a pi bond and you add something to both sides, for ozonolysis, you break both of the bonds. And it goes through this process and it's, it's very selective actually, because it doesn't break carbon-carbon sigma bonds apart, except where there's also a pi bond, right? So the rest of these bonds are all fine. You only break it apart where there's also a pi bond and a sigma bond at the same time. Um, because the, the first step is essentially we, you need those extra electrons to start breaking the ozone apart. So ozone normally has this structure, this it's O3 has uh, an oxygen with a formal charge of plus one and an oxygen with a formal charge of minus one and a resonance structure where it goes back and forth between them. Um, so it's neutral overall, but it's still not super stable. Um, it's a little bit more stable than, uh, say, a peroxide ion, but not by very much. And having all those electrons in a row allows us to, in a, um, having that overall shape allows us to make this ozonide three-sided ring where you get three oxygens in a row basically just attaching to the two carbons that were part of the alkene. All right, so basically think of it as you're sort of attaching a suction cup to the top of your pi bond. It th takes three arrows to draw it. Um, but effectively what you're doing is you're breaking a pi bond and, and giving electrons to the oxygen. The net result is this ozonide intermediate. Then it does this sort of weird rearrangement where it goes from the initial ozonide to a more stable ozonide. So this initial ozonide, which is also called this molozonide, 
And I actually have no idea how it's pronounced. I've never actually heard it pronounced in real life. So I would assume it's molozonide, but who knows? Um, and it basically, you wind up breaking off part of your molecule. You break that carbon-carbon sigma bond in order to have it rearranged to make this more stable ozonide. And this more stable ozonide still has still has an oxygen oxygen single bond, still has a peroxide bond, but it only has one. As opposed to that molozen, the molozenide had two peroxide bonds. So that was pretty unstable. So it goes through this rearrangement where you break the carbon carbon sigma bond to make a carbonyl group. And then the carbonyl group immediately reattaches to the other oxygen again to get this ozonide structure. So like all the other ones, the, all the other mechanisms that have multiple steps, they have, if it has more than one step, that's generally because it has a relatively stable intermediate. And that relatively stable intermediate can last long enough that allows you to add a second reagent after the first reaction is completed. If everything has to be added at the same time, and it's all re it's then it's basically the intermediates are not stable enough that you could actually um, isolate them. Ozonides are actually stable enough you can actually capture an ozonide. Um, I you know you couldn't store it in a jar and put it on a shelf, but you could actually isolate it and test it. And so we can actually observe some of the, um, you know, an NMR spectrum and an IR spectrum of ozonides um, to, to some extent. Then the second part here is just going to be, just like with oxymercuration, demercuration, or hydroboration followed by oxidation. The second step is basically get rid of that, allow that intermediate to react with something else to get, get us to our final product. Um, and so basically it just gets called out as a mild reducing agent, the most common of which is dimethyl sulfide because it's also a fairly common um, aprotic solvent. So it's relatively cheap, easy to find, not, uh, I won't say non-toxic, but it's not that toxic. Um, occasionally you can, you will see people also use zinc, zinc in water. Um, zinc is a pretty good reducing agent um, because it wants to be oxidized so much. In theory, just about anything you could use zinc for, you could also use aluminum for, but aluminum might be a little too reactive. So most commonly you see it written as DMS. But the, and this one is another one where the, the mechanism is not fully understood. All we know is that we can take an ozonide, partially reduce it, reduce it using a mild reducing agent. And that gives us um, two carbonyls where the alkene was. When you say the mechanism is not fully understood, what does that mean for the? It means we don't know how to draw those arrows. We could draw the the red arrows, but we don't know. There are a couple possible ways we could go about it, and we don't know which one's right yet. Um, you know, so that's the sort of thing. Like we, when we first started learning about mechanisms, we started getting using experimental data. Okay, well, is it concerted or is it one step? And we could look at the rate law to determine that. And then, you know, things like that. Just looking at the rate law is not enough to determine whether or not this is, you know, it's enough to say whether it's first order, or second order, but not enough to be able to draw the arrows conclusively. Um, and again, yeah, we, we see that a lot with these two step mechanisms where the first step is well understood. And then the second step is basically, and then you just oxidize it or then you reduce it and stuff happens and you get a product. Um, and ozone is interesting and relevant enough in a lot of different places um, that there, 
ozone chemistry is almost its own field because you've got the ozone chemistry of what happens, you know, why do cars produce ozone, for instance, and understanding that and how do you minimize ozone when in an engine um, versus, you know, what happened to the ozone in the ozone layer? How is that regenerated through the process of, of solar radiation? And that's all fairly well understood, but ozone as a whole crops up in enough places that it winds up being sort of, um, and it behaves differently enough than a lot of other um, gases that we see that it shows up in a lot of um, um, specialties. You wind up needing to, to if you're going to study ozone, there's a lot of places you could go with that knowledge, um, industrially or, or in academia. That's our last mechanism. We only added six, seven new mechanisms this chapter, right? Um, so we're stepping it up from chapter seven, but at the same time, they're all following our same rules. The number one rule for mechanisms is you're showing electrons moving. And then we had our four basic steps, which were proton transfer, nucleophile attack, leaving group leaves and rearrangement. All, all of our steps to this point are pretty much just variations of those four starting motifs. There's some that are a little bit weird, like, oh, well, boron can be stable with or without a complete valence. Um, sometimes we have to take into account things like carbocation stability in order to know which possible intermediate we're making. But the mechanisms as a whole, it still might feel like memorizing at this point, but they should all at least make sense when you see them, even if you couldn't replicate them from a blank piece of paper yet. All right, so that's, that's all the new material here. And rather than start a new chapter and bring it, get into alkynes, our next chapter is alkynes, which is triple bonds. And we're just gonna go through most of these same reactions will happen in some form with alkynes. Um, because an alkyne is still just a carbon-carbon pi bond. It's just now you've got two carbon-carbon pi bonds in, in between the same two carbons. So a lot of these same mechanisms still apply. They're just going to finish up differently or rearrange differently, or they'll happen twice instead of just once. Um, so we'll keep expanding on those. But for now, let's just... Um, you guys want to go through some practice or... Okay, yeah, let's do some practice then. I saw some, some head nods. I'll give you guys a few minutes and then we'll go through a few of these. 
So, yeah, if, if it's showing the mechanism, um, you I want you to show forming the tetrahedral intermediate there and then the rearrangement to make the, the carbon directly attached to the boron for at least one of them. You don't have to draw out all three of those, the times that happen. You, if you show it once, then you can say two more times and then draw your, your trialkyl boron intermediate. 
I was curious, so I looked up ozonolysis of benzene and found uh, an old paper from early 1900s where they did the ozonolysis of benzene. And for every time on the benzene, the ozonide looks like this. Uh, as you can imagine, it's not particularly stable. Um, they were able to isolate it, and they got the papers in German, the translation that I found says they got a white, jelly like amorphous blob that when they poured warm water over it, it detonated. Might be. I don't know if we still have benzene. We got rid of benzene. And ozone is a gas, which means it's a real pain to work with. Reactants that are gases are generally we try to avoid that because it's you have to have a, a cylinder of it or generate it yourself and then like bubble it through a liquid. Ozone, you can buy cylinders of it, but they won't sell it to just anybody. And most stuff that we would you would consider buying cylinders of, um, either they either have to be something that a welding gas store would carry, or it has to be something that you get from a specialty chemical supplier. Like we tried to get liquid nitrogen because it's not that uncommon to have liquid nitrogen in the lab. It's fairly safe. And Prax Air here in town wouldn't wouldn't do it for us, wouldn't order it for us. Um, which I mean, yeah, that's quite Yeah, it's not very tightly regulated if you pay enough. If we just don't want to pay enough to get it from somewhere down the hill, because then you have to pay for shipping of us of a cylinder and that anyway. I mean, that probably would work. Yeah, they typically make very small amounts. And so if you want it to be pure enough and also be in a large enough amount, those ozone generators, yeah, they'll, they'll make some, but they, we could, I, we, we looked at that at one point. I looked at that for a, for a lab and there was a reason we didn't go with it. And I think just the, the amounts that would take um, and the concentrations, because you would wind up like, okay, maybe, even if you can make an appreciable amount of ozone, you still have it mixed in with oxygen and nitrogen gas. Yeah. Um, and so trying to take that, capture it in a way, basically you'd have to put one of those ozone generators under a bell with a tube coming off of it and bubbling it into liquid from there. Um, and it's just, that's not, we're not set up to do that here. If we, if we really wanted to, actually probably the Culligan people, probably the people that are doing our eye, our DI water might be the best ones because they probably sell an ozone, ozone purification system for water. Um, that we could repurpose, but it would be very expensive and we'd have to still retrofit it ourselves. And there are plenty of other OCHEM labs we can do. All right, let's go through, we'll do the left side first so I have room to, to draw. So first one, hydration, right? Add an OH group. And it's the anti Markovnikov. So our first one is going to be nope, not that. <laughs> 
right? So adding the OH to the less substituted and there's no stereo center created because both of the carbons that reacted um, have two identical substituents. The, the ring is identical in both directions and the carbon that has the OH has two hydrogens on it. So no stereochemistry, which is pleasant. Um, for C, it's the first step is formation of an epoxide. So I'm gonna draw the intermediate, even though you wouldn't need to, to answer this question, but just for practice. And we would get R plus S in this case. And then the second step is just that ring opening reaction, right? So we'd wind up with our final reaction or our final product being the and we just have to remember that it's only the anti addition. So I combine with it does mostly because you're going to get that one also. So because the intermediate could have the epoxide facing out towards us or going away from us, that means that our product could have either of the two, it would have both of these. Yeah, so, so if we were, yeah, let's draw it with a little bit more specifically here. Um, and actually we'll start with the, the epoxide. Let's go. So this is what we're starting with. When we make the epoxide, It looks a little bit strained. So the top carbon that's part of the epoxide has also has a hydrogen attached that we wouldn't normally draw. The other one has all, all four carbons drawn already. So you basically have to pick one of the two that's sort of in the same direction of as the um, bond sticking out towards us and make it going away from us. So since I, I want to consider that active bond where the pi bond was, I want to keep that in the plane of the board for the sake of, of seeing what's going on. I would to keep that one planar and make that one our dotted line. And so then when you have the other oxygen coming in, you just have to pick one of the ones that winds up in the same direction as the oxygen to be the op in the opposite direction. So um, we'd wind up with, and actually, oh, that's not what I meant. It's gonna be there. It's not still gonna be there, of course. Um, so you're going to wind up with one. It's going to look like this. And so you, you could, so based on the way that I had it drawn, it made more sense for me to make the cyclohexyl group away from us. If you had drawn it the other direction, then you could have drawn that meth that bottom methyl group is going into the board. Um, and sorry, and then the um, the other would be 
Um, so I would draw it as like that based on the way that the way that I drew the intermediate initially would make the most sense. The most important thing is that you show that the two hydrogens are opposite of each other. But yeah, when we have all four bonds shown, um, you do usually that you don't always have to show one going into the board every time you show one coming out of the board, because you can also treat these tetrahedrals as though three of them are flat and the other one is 90 degrees to them. Right? If you think of them as being a true tetrahedron with the carbon, the tetrahedral carbon is in the middle of the tetrahedron. The three of them are flat relative to each other, even if technically all three of those bonds are going slightly away from from you. But the main thing is that the other one would be coming straight out. I think a lot of times, if you look up the structure of uh, cholesterol, that's all I want. There's a couple of carbons that have all four bonds drawn like that one, but you only have one of them shown as coming out of the board because you just, okay, the other three are relatively flat to each other. So that's that whole Basically, yeah. If you consider the rings being flat, we know they're not truly flat, but they're flat enough for drawing this. The, the, that methyl would just be, you would think of it as just coming straight out. Because if you change your frame of reference, you could say that that methyl that this is the bond going into the board, or you could look at it from this way, and then this bond looks like it's going into the board. Right? You just change which direction you're looking at it from. Um, it does, it gets a little bit tricky with rings and also trying to show stereochemistry sometimes because it doesn't follow our, our easiest way to draw tetrahedral carbon is two bonds are flat, one in, one out. But that's not always the easiest way to draw these more complicated molecules. <clears throat> All right, if we just do, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if we just do an acid catalyzed hydration, Markovnikov, Nothing changes except we wind up with here's another case where we can draw it just like that and then just say plus en because going through the carbocation ion intermediate means we'll get both of those the way it's going to attach coming towards us or going away from us. We have an, another epoxide formation. So another anti-dihydroxylation. And we don't have any ring structures here, but we do wind up with two asymmetric carbons. So we do still need to pay attention to the fact that it's anti. Then again, the easiest way to do that is to keep everything that's not, all the carbons that aren't moving, keep them flat. And then just say, okay, well, If I have one OH that's coming out towards us, that means on the other side, I'm gonna have one OH going away from us. Plus the version that's reversed. And since all of our stereo centers are flipping in that one, we could just write plus EN. But you don't want to write, just draw it with no stereochemistry and say R plus S, because there are actually four stereoisomers, right? You could have RR, RS, SR, SS, and we don't get all of them. We only get these two specifically. When in doubt with the stereochemistry, be more specific. Um, based on the mechanism, 
rather than then trying to save time on that one. And last but not least, we have osmium tetroxide. It winds up being catalytic if you also use, I'm trying to, I'm blanking on what MMO is at this point. Um, it's uh, basically the result is that it allows us to regenerate the osmium tetraoxide um, as over the course of this reaction. You still make that osmium ester and then you reduce it. And if you use the right reducing agent, um, you, can, you can regenerate that OSO4. So it winds up not being as wasteful and as toxic that way. And osmium is pretty expensive. Plus you don't want to have to pay for, for the um, disposal if you can avoid it. So if you can make it catalytic, you don't need as much of it. And so that means less to dispose of. So it'll be a syn dihydroxylation. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I remember how I was doing this before. No, oh, that's what I want. So we're starting here. We're going to add an OH to both sides and facing the same direction. So if we make if we make both of these methyls going away from us, we can draw both of the oxygens coming out towards us. So we get something that looks like that once it rearranges into its you know, more, more stable conformer or the enantiomer. Which would look like the two methyls coming out towards us and the two oxygens going away from us. And just for the sake of looking the, at this in 3D, so here's you know those methyls that are drawn coming straight out towards us. If you make the rings look flat, they do look like they're coming right out towards us, right? But if you shift our frame of view a little bit, now you can draw each of these carbons in the way that looks a little bit more similar to what we're used to seeing for a tetrahedral carbon but it makes the rings harder to visualize. So keeping the rings flat and then just knowing, okay, I have to draw it in two dimensions. I have to draw it as coming straight up here, but really it's right out at us. It takes getting used to, but it's way more convenient than trying to actually show this entire molecule with every carbon having actual tetrahedral shape to it. Treat the ring structures like they're flat, treat everything that's not an asymmetric center like it's flat, and then just stick things in or out. Right? Is it possible for the double bonds right there, the high bonds right there in the bottom mm -hmm. um, to go through one of these mechanisms in our body? Yeah. And given the given what so most reactions in our body are enzyme catalyzed. And so um, one of the reasons that that hormones in general and neurotransmitters are so complicated is because they're all set a bunch of equilibrium reactions that are all linked together. So cholesterol is formed when um, is actually used to make a variety of different hormones in men. It's used primarily to make an uh, androgen and testosterone are both both derivatives of cholesterol. And a lot of times you start from this base molecule and you make a couple tweaks here or there. And so it happens all the time 
and in you know in women it's the same cholesterol is turned into also androgen but then also estrogen right so they're all these linked equilibrium reactions that are happening that are based on exterior um factors diet um you know mood mood is a function of neurotransmitters and hormones but at the same time mood affects other neurotransmitters and hormones and you know time and life cycle all these things are all linked together um which is so basically if you think of you know how many different molecules and and hormones and neurotransmitters you have in your body every single one of them is a linked equilibrium reaction to everything else um so yeah you would wind up if you tried to treat that as a system of equations you wind up with with a matrix that's you know 1000 by 1000 um where every element of that is a piece in an equilibrium reaction um so it winds up being a fairly complex system we can't just model it or really to link any one of those molecules yeah you know, it's really overly simplistic to say you know serotonin is what controls your mood serotonin is the one we have the most evidence is linked to mood but serotonin is linked to everything else so it's you can't really point to any one thing as being representing something as complicated as as emotion or thought or consciousness or anything really it is it is that's one of the reasons why neurology is still in its infancy is because we just recently have had the tools to be able to start understanding some of these linkages um plus if you're all of your different organisms are starting from different places even when you're dealing with just with mice or zebrafish every zebrafish has a different you know internal life and emotion and starting point when it comes to these even if most of them are kind of are pretty close together even clones have slightly different concentrations to start with which means it you know you wind up with a butterfly effect sometimes where a slight difference in you know one tiny mutation um in these clones at the beginning of their life cycle and they wind up going totally different directions and now all of a sudden your modeling is all useless anyway um was there anything on the second side that you guys specifically wanted to go over all right so we have we have two minutes the trickiest one here that you're least used to is probably the ozonolysis so i suppose we could go over this real quick The main thing here is that you're going to actually wind up with both of those linkages getting broken up, which means you're going to wind up with the part on the right hand side that I circled in red is going to turn into acetone. You break the pi bond, replace it with an oxygen, and you get this. Part you circle in blue, it can be helpful to redraw it with everything in pretty much the same spot as it was. And then, especially when you're doing one of these ring openings, you still wind up with all six carbons, right? And so the um, on the, the piece, the cyclostructure, but they're not in a cyclo group anymore. So you can either then like just kind of jam in the oxygens here. That's really what we would get, right? And so you, it could be helpful to draw it like that first and then immediately turn around and redraw it in a in a more standard configuration. Which would look like that. It's still the same number of carbons, so three carbons on one side and six carbons on the other side. But every place that there was a carbon carbon pi bond, we turned into a carbonyl. All right, so it takes a little practice with the ozonolysis sometimes because it looks vastly different. So start by drawing it with everything the same and then redraw it in a way that's that's neater 
um, if you have to, and so that you're not drawing all of them on top of each other. Well, then, and the nice thing about this is, is that you can, however many pi bonds you start with, you should wind up with twice as many carbonyls, right? Because both sides of this turn into a carbonyl, right? So two pi bonds means that our products should have a total of four carbonyls. And if you did it right, that's that's one way to keep track of, of what you're doing. If, as long as you wind up with four carbonyls and the same number of carbons on the other side, even if it's in two different molecules, you're probably on the right track. Brad? So my question is, and and ozone is unstable enough inherently um it's a combination and then you wind up making that ozone is unstable enough that it can make that mole ozonide which is also unstable enough that it'll rearrange and break that carbon carbon sigma bond as well as the pi bond it just does it in two steps you go from one one kind of stable molecule as the alkene and one really unstable molecule as the ozone then you make something that's less stable and then you rearrange it from there and so Break the pi bond, break the sigma bond, then you reduce it to make the, the carbonyls at the end. So it takes it takes some steps and takes some practice, but um, that's probably the single trickiest reaction to draw the products from this chapter, even if the mechanism is not as hard or as long at least as some of the others. All right, anything else before we go for the day? Um, just a quick question about D. Yeah. Um, would you want us to draw a dimension or could we just. No, so I'm not really that picky when it comes to, you know, for, for while you're getting used to it still, it's a good idea to do it just so that for the sake of not forgetting what you're doing. Um, but no, you, I would not mark you down if you did not draw the hydrogens. Cool. All right. Good job, everybody. And uh, watch.